Two days ago, I saw a rig that could hold that tanker. You want to get out of here? Talk to me. Hello and welcome back to the Movie Pope Podcast. And today we are taking a look at Furiosa, another installment in the Mad Max saga that surprisingly doesn't really feature Mad Max at all. Um, but before we dive in, remember to like. He was in there for a whole ten seconds, Luca. Let's not undersell that fact. So he he was in it for like ten seconds, and at least we saw his back, right? I mean, for all we know, it could have been it could have been someone else. It couldn't didn't necessarily That's have to be Mad Max. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it could have been. I mean, it could have been. It could have been Joe or something like that. <laughs> um, but um, but remember to like, comment, subscribe, and as always, thanks so much for watching. And let's dive in. Um, so Lee Furiosa was um, you know, was a movie that was expected to um kick off this year with a bang, um, by taking another franchise that we all knew and love. And you know, give it a uh, a new lease on life. But um, but as I told you, you you know, back in the spring, I didn't have really high hopes for Furiosa, and the box office numbers substantiated my uh, my prediction. Um, so I was wrong. I was totally wrong about that because I thought the exact opposite. I thought that the first one had built up enough goodwill that a lot of people would see this, and I was totally wrong. So I will take the L for that one. Oh, well, you heard it! You heard it here, folks. The movie Pope can be wrong. <laughs> um, um, so, so Lee, why don't you go ahead and uh, take us into um, Furiosa, a Mad Max saga? Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, we we get to follow Furiosa, and I have to admit, I think I like the opening, right? And I and I don't mind admitting that I, I did like how the opening happened, where we get to meet Furiosa. We meet her as you know, a little kid. And I really kind of like this idea that she's in this paradise in the desert, right? You know, she's got this nice little oasis that she lives at, um, which is really cool. Uh, and, I, and I like that, you know, I wish we got to see a little bit more of it. Like, we see just a little bit of it. I wish they kind of gave us a little bit more uh, understanding of where she lived. Um, but, you know, we kind of um, have to get right to the action, right? So, um, and the, really within, like, the first few minutes... Um, Furiosa is kidnapped and her mom kind of goes on this, um, I guess, mission, right, to both save Furiosa and protect the identity of this oasis, right, to keep it away from other people that might be looking to get in there. Um, and <laughs> immediately I, I, my, I could not stop thinking about this, but why the hell would you not have, like, guards and stuff? at like kind of the outskirts of this oasis right like to me you would not even know that these people were here these marauders that came in to kidnap her we wouldn't even know that if furiosa didn't have like a little whistle that was like letting people know what was going on um and that bugged me because like if you're trying to protect this area from all the terrible atrocities that are happening outside because we see outside of this oasis the world's a shit show right mm -hmm. so the fact that you don't have anybody around drove me crazy because it's like you have to protect it and you know it's important to protect its identity because you literally have furiosa's mom going on this mission to kill everyone that kidnapped her for both reasons of saving her and to protect its secrecy so then why don't you have people out there that just drove me insane am i thinking too much into it or did that also become weird for you i mean i kind of got the impression they were a bunch of peace loving hippies <laughs> i mean it, it, it's it, it's it had, it had, a, it had yeah. a commune vibe to it you know what i mean like it it, it kind of because the way they interacted with with each other like you kind of get the impression like these are people who are very secretive they like they, they they pretty much go out of their way to hide not only themselves but the location of their um oasis paradise which by the way i will say this like i I kind of wish we you know, we learned a little bit more about her mother and the people. Yeah. The, the only reference that we get is her drawing a star chart on her arm as, as, as a sort of guide for her way to get back home. And that's pretty much it. But we don't really know anything else about why this place is important to her, what kind of relationship or impact her, her mother had on her other apart from the fact that her mom, you know, is willing to risk her life 
and she and she does risk her life um, to try and go and get her from these yep. uh, from these marauders. See, and it's it's interesting. Like I said, you, you describe it as a commune, right? Yet, like we see how clearly badass the Feroces mom's character is, right? Like these to me, like they really depict them as being more like they're highly trained and specialized in stuff. And the fact that you you show that, yet you don't think that they're smart enough to have like lookouts for stuff, just made it more distracting to me. Or or because at least would, or at least build or at least build like a defense network. You know? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because yeah, like if you make it a commune, that's fine, right? If you show everyone like just being like just really weak and pathetic, then that's fine, right? Because then it makes sense why they want to do that. But you can't show them being like highly trained because like she's out there with a sniper rifle picking people off on bikes going who knows how fast in the desert, right? Like you can't show that and then also show them being totally ignorant to having basic defenses around that, that would keep them a secret. So that was to, to your point, that's the part that's confusing. But um all that aside, I do agree. Like, I really liked this initial chase sequence that kind of gets the plot going um, because you have this very clear ticking clock element to you want to, number one, for Furiosa's mother. I believe her name was Mary. Did you did you happen to catch that at all? Um, no, I, I, I just felt like this chase sequence was kind of dragging on a little bit to be honest okay then that's fair so it's i believe it's mary right i don't remember if it ever got said in the actual movie but we'll go ahead she's gonna be mary if i'm right or wrong yeah uh, i guess my bad for that but um instead of keep, keep calling her furiosa mom so mary is on this mission to save furiosa and mm -hmm. she has to you know kill these uh, marauders that came in um to kidnap furiosa so we kind of follow the sequence and like I said, I personally enjoyed it. I think it was kind of a, a fun way to uh, get us kind of involved with the action that the first one was so well known for. Um, and, you know, you kind of have this sense of urgency that she's got to be able to get there to um, kind of save everything. So you see she kind of slowly is picking people off. Um, I like the fact they show Furiosa is obviously very, um, I would say, smart. Like you see her bite like the, the, the fuel cord, whatever it's called. The yeah. fuel hose. Um, so, like, she's clearly, you know, a, a very smart girl that knows and understands what she needs to do in this situation. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of end up having um, one of the modders does make it back with her. And that was kind of surprising to me. I'm like, oh, dang, like, she's actually captured, which, I mean, I guess knowing what we do about um, Furiosa from the original one makes sense. Um, but you see, like, she gets captured. Um, and the mom right infiltrates to get her back um and we do get to meet um uh dementis right so dementis played by chris hemsworth this is his little um i guess uh, army that he has and we get to meet him a little bit and obviously dementis is very curious about where this goes from um and uh, i like the fact that Furiosa just shows like she's not going to give up any information um i also like the fact that when the guy <laughs> that is severely injured is trying to communicate where this place is. She just kind of like starts kicking them in the head. And, and I thought that was great. Uh, she's just like, uh, but I, I, cause it really just shows that for the character, this is so important to hide the secret. Like they're willing to do anything in order to protect it, which makes this next sequence really dumb to me. Right. Because what we have happen is you have Mary comes into um comes into the uh, encampment right under kind of this um sandstorm that's going on she finds furiosa she kills one of the would-be captors but then lets the other one live and i absolutely hated that moment i i just i can't stand in movies when you show this character who's a total badass, right? She's picking people off. She understands the importance of her role. Like, hey, I have to protect my people. I have to protect my daughter. Yet you don't kill this person because she says she's a mom? I hated that. I absolutely hated that. What did you feel about that part? Because I absolutely loathe that part, and that totally took me out of this scene. Come on, Lee. Parents have to set a good example for their kids. I mean, <laughs> yeah, clearly it's a okay to be captured and you know to like be tortured. You're probably going to have 
the worst imaginable things done to you. But hey, if they say they're a mom, then it's okay. I, I just I, I was I, well, I was gonna say like I was gonna say how funny would that have been? If she, <laughs> if she said if she said I'm sorry, sweetie, you had to see that. But I'm trying to set an example. I'm not gonna kill this bastard because oh I don't want you ending up like me. <laughs> I I just I I couldn't I couldn't even <laughs> rationalize what they were thinking in that sequence. Because it totally it's, just... it's the first it's the first of many, uh my yes, <laughs> yes. yes, this is where I think when you try to focus more on the story, it's easier to pick things out. When you're just like a big action set piece, people don't think about that much. But no. if you're trying to help create no. this world, you need to like fill it with characters that would be like that Mary, she would ask to be the first person killed in a horror film. Because she's just too dumb to exists in this world and i just i really dislike that because you create this character that's a total badass she's totally awesome she's picking people off like she does everything and then you just have her be a total buffoon and it ultimately leads to her death where she is like rescuing <laughs> furiosa from um this encampment right and she's on this bike and like I said, I, I find it really hard to believe that they're going to be able to follow them in this giant sandstorm. Like, this is a really big sandstorm. And they try to, like, explain, like, a dog is tracking them. But I'm like, okay, let's be real here. I don't think that dog is tracking anything, <laughs> right? So she, in another, at least in my opinion, uh, another step of total just ignorance, she's like, well, I'm going to have Furiosa gone alone. And I'm going to kind of, like just sacrifice myself to buy her time, which I don't feel like is even needed. Did you feel like, did she need a stop for them? Like, what, what was your feeling about her ultimate sacrifice to give her child time when I don't even feel like it was needed? I mean, it was a waste because, you know, because she doesn't take advantage of it, you know? Yeah, like, absolutely, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, well, well, I just want to circle back to even what, more. I, I just want to circle back to what you said because the, because, because the fact that, um, because the fact that you have the mother behaving like this, I I'm, I think it kind of does a disservice to the whole spirit of Mad Max. Because the entire idea is that you are living in a cruel, you know, ruthless world, right? So why wouldn't she, you know, behave in a very ruthless manner, right? Because that would have been a very important lesson for few. Because I imagine she's she's living a very sheltered life at this point. So for her, so for her mother to kind of, you know, you know, kill all, you know, kill all these you know, marauders. So, you know, so they don't find their oasis, you know, paradise. I think that would be a pretty good lesson for, for her to teach Furiosa and just say, Hey, you know, the world out there isn't as uh, isn't as peachy, you know, no pun intended um, as you think. So Ooh, I like know, that. That's a good one. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, sorry, you have to see that sweetheart, but you know, yeah, the, the, the world isn't as uh, isn't as nice as yeah. I think it is. I, I, I mean, that would have that would have made a lot more sense rather than the mother just trying to act all high and noble, only to get her you know only to get her ass you know handed to her later on, and she gets you know literally strung up and you know and made a spectacle for everybody to see. Really, yeah, absolutely. And and to your point, right? I, I can maybe understand like you know, the fact that she lives in this oasis is kind of like this, like, really I idealized society where, like, people maybe don't act like that. But to your point, right, we don't exist in that world. We see how much of that world is just absolutely terrible. And, and I think that for the audience, we can understand that sometimes you have to do, you have to kill, <laughs> you have to do terrible things in order to protect what's the most important. And I feel like you don't really give the audience that in this example because she just makes one bad choice out of another, which just feels totally, I can't really say out of character because we don't really know her character, but we see someone yeah. that's a total badass. Um, and then she just seems to make total, have like total gaffes in logic. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's just the way I look at it. So. Yeah. Um, but yeah, to, to your point, right? So you got, um, you know, the, the mom ends up getting strung up and she's pretty much killed right in front of Furiosa's eyes. Um, and um, Dementis is now kind of her, um, I don't want to say father figure, I guess captor would be the best way to describe it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, even though he kind of like kind of totes around as his, as his daughter, which was weird, but you know, I, 
it is what it is. Um, but yeah, and this to me is where I also have some issues with the pacing of this movie. So the movie was about two hours and 20, two hours, 30 minutes long. So it's, it's a little bit long as far as movies go. And to me, this is the part that I just really couldn't get into because I would say we've been as young Furiosa for the first chapter, right? Because it's broken down in chapters. So we see this first chapter. To me, this is where you want to kind of get it to kind of the current Furiosa that we want to see, right? Which is Anya Taylor-Joy. But they don't do that. And I think that this whole sequence for me is where the pacing just kind of kills everything that kind of goes on with this. Did you yeah. think that we spent too much time as young Furiosa in this? I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'll say this: like if they, like if they included events in there that that kind of shaped her outlook and kind of kind of inform us on 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 how she's going to turn up later on in the movie, that would make sense. But I mean, there were just, I mean, there are just moments where you sit there and you're like, man, that could have been left on the cutting room floor. That could have been left on the cutting room For floor. Sure. I mean, obviously that could have been left on the cutting room floor. So it's like, I, I mean, it's all filler. And I'm thinking somewhere along the line, someone, George Miller's like, you know, shit, we're supposed to fill up, you know, two hours and 30 minutes. All right. Um, well, let, let's just, let's just, you know, keep this in here because it, you know, eats up some time, you know, some screen time. And I'm sure the audience will be smart enough to kind of extrapolate meaning from all of this, which there is no meaning. It's just, it's just filler really. I mean, yeah. uh, now, now, unless you're a Chris Hemsworth fanboy, you know, it's, you know, it's more, it's more of an opportunity for you to see Chris Hemsworth, you know, riding oh, yeah. around like a Roman general with the, yeah. with the hipster oh, yeah. it's beard. It's the Dementia show for yeah. uh, the, for the next half an hour. This is the Dementia yeah. show. It barely even has Furiosa in it. So, um, cause yeah, like, you know, we have Dementis and now he's, you know, kidnapped Furiosa and keeps around. And, you know, for Dementis, he obviously wants to find this what he calls the land of plenty, where she comes from, but Furiosa refused to give it up. Um, so in Dementis' travels, he stumbles upon the Citadel, right, where we get to meet a Morton Joe once again. Um, so we see a Morton Joe, so this kind of helps tie in how this story is going to happen. Um, and uh, I kind of like the fact that Dementis kind of goes in there thinking he's like hot shit. Um, and then a Morton Joe's like, hey, hold my gasoline. I'm going to show you what that really means. <laughs> um, and, and like, just totally, I love the fact that he just totally shows how crazy, like his people are. And I, I like Dementis is like, okay, I'm out of here. Right. I'm out. I'm not going to deal with this. Uh, and he ends up leaving. Um, and then uh, Dementis ends up, um, he kind of does this Trojan horse like sequence, right. To break into um, a, a kind of, like, I think, how we're trying to build this role, right? We get to go to a, a city called Gas Town. Yeah, it's a huge um, refinery, so kind of, basically. Yes, exactly. Right, it's an oil refinery. There, um, you know, they clearly have this deal with the Citadel, both Gas Town um, and the Citadel. They have this kind of trade agreement um, for supplies, and um, Dementis ends up, you know, kind of uh, uh, getting an oil refiner and pretty much <laughs> does this like Trojan horse type of thing, um, which, like I said, luckily I guess works for him. Um, and they're able to uh, get into Gas Town, uh, and this is where uh, Dementis uh, kind of gains Gas Town as this like hub. And for him, you know, he wants to be able to control it. So this is him like kind of making a power play in the world that we live in, which I, I do think I find interest with this. Right? I think this is where the world building does work because it's interesting to kind of see these other characters um, that are building the world. Um, it just unfortunately doesn't do a whole lot. It feels like it's more just to put things into place to get um, um, to get Furiosa with a Morton Joe, which is what ends up happening. So Dementis um, ends up going to a Morton Joe, and he's making all these. Um, uh, I would say um, trying to make a deal with him, and <laughs> This is this sequence is always weird to me because there's not a whole lot of humor in this, right? Like this is a pretty dry um, movie 
And obviously, Dementis ends up, you know, he's a very colorful character, so you can kind of laugh at it. But this to me was really odd because it was the only time, like, I just remember laughing and being like, why am I laughing in this type of movie? It does, just doesn't feel that way. Because mm -hmm. um, you get, like, this random sprinkling of jokes where Dementis shows up and he's got, like, this stuff attached to his nipples and, like, the nipples get ripped off and you have like the guy that's trying to punch in the code and he's like i don't remember what the code is and it's like what's why are we having these gags now like this is really weird we're almost like an hour into this film it's been really bleak so far i don't understand why you want to inject humor um i, I what, what did you think about that did you did it did this something st stick out to you when they're doing like this trade discussion and there's just all this like random ha ha humor in it I mean, what was it trying to do exactly? Because I'm like, yeah, because I'm like sat there watch, w watching. I'm like, all right, so he's so apparently they're doing some sort of BDSM thing with his nipples. His nipples get ripped off, and then you know, and then Rictus is you know going ape shit over the over the code and everything. And I'm and it, it was one of those moments where I'm literally conf you know confused and lost as to what it's adding to the story. Yeah. Because to your because to your point, if if it's an attempt at humor, it kind of it kind of falls flat on its face because, because uh, because unless you you really really enjoy seeing you know people's you know nipples get ripped off, I mean it really it, it really doesn't do anything to the storyline. Yes, um, I will say, not a fan of that. Just just to go on record, not a fan of seeing nipples get ripped off. Yeah. <laughs> well, any body part for for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but another thing, but another thing that I that, that I find r really really odd as well is the fact that you've already got the um the the former leader of Gas Town like strapped in that weird I guess you know neck cage thing. Stalk contraption. So, so 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 why go through you know all all this rigmarole with the nipples and the code and everything really? Because I mean, sure. it, because you've already got the dude right there, you know, right there, right. So, uh, so, so I mean, I mean, and not, not obviously, Morton Joe doesn't seem like the kind of guy who cares about what happens to his underlings because we see what happened to the War Boys. But mm -hmm. still, you know, but still, I would figure that you know the the former leader of Gastown would you know, you know would hold some you know some weight in a Morton Joe's mind. So. You know, so he so he would you know try to do something to kind of negotiate with Dementis over his life, but uh, mm. apparently, but apparently he's just there because you know we need some heads to get exploded or whatever. Yes, I don't know. And, and more importantly, right, this is where Furiosa ends up getting um, traded to a Morton Joe, right? So this kind of puts the 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 pieces into play for what. Oh wait, we know wait, Furiosa's in this movie? I totally forgot. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? You would think so, because she's been sitting in the back for some time now while we've had the Dementis show going on. Um, and remember, right, this is a Mad Max film. So um, notice we haven't even mentioned his name once. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's like, yeah have, it's, like, it's like drink every time you see Mad Max, right? <laughs> I know, right? It's going to be the world's easiest drinking game. Um, so we have um, Furiosa, who ends up... Um, you know, getting traded, um, and we kind of see her, you know, a little bit there um, as a kid. Um, but eventually, we we get this nice fast forward sequence where we fast forward where Furiosa pretty much is living at the Citadel, like disguised as like a guy, and she's just pretty much been there for her whole like really childhood until however old she's supposed to be. As Anya Taylor Joy, I, I don't know how much time elapsed uh, in that. I don't remember if they show that or not. Um, um, I don't think it really matters because yeah, it, it, it because just, it, because at least at least now we're seeing the move we're seeing the movie kind of you know move forward rather than yes. you know give us another this scene. Is, this is literally about an hour into it, right? So mm -hmm. just for everyone to understand, right, we're an hour and in before Anya Taylor Joy's Furiosa shows up. Um, and this brought up another thing that drove me absolutely crazy. Um, if her purpose is to escape and go back home, how the hell did she not figure this out the whole time she's at the Citadel? Like, I don't understand that at all. I mean, it's, not, it's not like she didn't know how to get back. I mean, for God's sake, yeah. she, drew, she drew a star chart on her on her 
fucking arm, you know? Yeah, like, you can't tell me that it's hard to get, like, a vehicle in this role. Like, I, I don't think they have that stuff on lockdown. Like, I feel like if you show this character being totally badass that's capable of doing so much, it's really hard to me to fathom that she couldn't just, like, save resources and do everything you could so you could escape. Like, that to me just drove me crazy because it's like, is she capable of this or not? Because, like, you can't show her being a badass, but then show how she's totally incapable of leaving and going back home. Because you know, initially you would think, like, it's for, like, you would think it's for revenge, right? Like, maybe, like, yeah. oh, she wants to get revenge or something, but that's not the case because we see later on when she's, you know, meets Praetorian Jack that she just wants to go go back to her home. And that, that just drove me crazy. Did What did you think about that? The fact that she was just in the Citadel for like a decade, and I guess she was just trying to move up the ranks for I don't know what purpose. Two words. Stockholm Syndrome. I mean, okay, that's that's actually pretty fair. I uh, mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, because think about it, like, because think about it, you've got so many people, you know, at the Citadel, right? People going in and out, doing whatever it is. It's not like she's going to be missed. I mean, she could have, I mean, I mean, because she could have taken part in a convoy, like delivering cabbages to, you know, to the mortifiers and to Dementis, you know, every was every three days or every 10 days. She could have just like ducked out like on the way back and nobody, you know, nobody would be, you know, any wiser. Right. Yeah. But but you kind of get the feeling that she's kind of developed like this sense, this sense of belonging, however weird it is. And, you know, and, and she feels, I guess, quote unquote, safe at the Citadel. And, you know, you know, rather than, you know, having to journey back to, you know, the the kibbutz that she came from and possibly have to have to deal with the fact that um, she's got to tell her sister. And see, see, th this is what I was thinking. I was, <laughs> I was thinking the reason why she didn't want to go back is because she doesn't want to go and face her sister and say, hey, you know what happened to mom? Yeah, she didn't make it. <laughs> Well, I, I think I, I think she would have done anything to avoid having to go back and she, have that awkward, awkward conversation. Yeah, she's playing quite the long con if that's the case, because, you know, <laughs> Stockholm Syndrome side, which, like I said, we're not uh, psychiatrists or psychologists or whatever. Right. Um, but she really that hit her hard really quick because she was barely in the Citadel um, as far as I'm concerned before that all happens. But. But yeah, so we do get her. So she's been at the Citadel, you know, kind of disguising herself um, this whole time. Um, doesn't speak, um, I guess, once again, kind of under the guise of being male. Um, so we have um, Furiosa, and this is where she meets. Um, and I don't even know how to describe. We, we meet Praetorian Jack. Yeah, what, um, what exactly? Is, is, he, is he like the main convoy driver, or is he just like... The yeah, best driver I think in the he, city. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, I, that's the way I understood it, right? Like he was the best driver, so he was the one that when you had a mission, you had to do right. Praetorian Jack was the one you had to call. Um, and it's weird because like I couldn't quite put my finger on what they wanted this character to be to Furiosa. Like, was he a friend? Was he supposed to be like a love interest? Like they never really show that. But, you know, I think with any film, when you have a male and female together, I think people's minds go towards that. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, what what did you feel like their relationship was? Because I really couldn't put my finger on it. Well, with the way he met his end, we'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yes, I guess spoilers um, in our. I mean, I mean, I mean, not that it. <laughs> Review. I was gonna say, well, not that it mattered anyway, because he, because he, because apart from just being, you know, you know, the guy who, you know, who, you know, who you called on to you know, transport cabbages to, you know, one, you know, one area of Australia to another, I mean, he really didn't add much to the story, right? Yes, uh, yes, I, I think it's he's kind of there to, I, I guess, yeah, it's weird, like he doesn't really add a lot, right? So he's like the really critical driver. And I guess this is where we kind of get some more fun action sequences because like he pointed out, um, so he's like helping transport this stuff to gas town. Um, and, um, you know, this is where we kind of see a uh, Furios's character. Like she's now on the rig. I forget what the name of the rig was. They had a name for, it. I don't remember what it was. The war rig. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think there was. I think they had like a special name for it, but I don't remember um, what it was. I remember she called it out, but um, but yeah. So she's she's on this oil rig with him, and um, you know she kind of uh, I guess I guess working her way up, maybe not super right because really she just kind of is the only survivor. So she kind of <laughs> she kind of moves up through the ranks because everyone else dies. Mm -hmm. um, but you know we kind of see her and Jack. They kind of start to you know create this relationship um maybe romantic maybe platonic don't know i mean um, but it was but the thing was it was just so contrived it was so forced there's nothing organic about it you know it's true, like yeah yeah it, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like it's like when you watch scene it, it, it's almost as if okay on this cue you develop you know you look over at furiosa and you have some sort of mixed feelings about her because you realize wow she's not a dude and i don't feel gay for having weird thoughts about this you know, very effeminate boy now. Because yeah, I mean, he's because right, he's really surprised to see that she's a chick. You know, <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a lot of things that you can look in to that, right? Um, but yeah, like as far as like the overall story goes, like you have, um, you know, now you see like you know he's making these deliveries with her, um, Jack and Furiosa. Uh, eventually, they go to um, Oil Town, right? And, and Oil Town um has or i'm sorry gas town excuse me whatever wrong, wrong name sorry about that gas town um and we see pretty much like how it's been um since um dementis has been there it's been pretty much like run into the ground um so this gas town that used to be really good has been kind of you know falling into the pits with leadership so he's a bad leader um and we also get to see a new place called bullet farm um, which is where I think kind of the climax really starts. So um, pretty much um, Jack and Furiosa, along with their crew, are going to Bullet Farm um, because they want to, um, the Citadel wants to attack um, Dementis' group. So um, they go kind of on a side quest to go pick up uh, ammunition from um, the, the Bullet Farm place. And what ends up happening is, is, uh, Dementis is actually there. So there's this kind of like big chase sequence um, where somehow um, Furiosa and Jack manage to escape. Um, however, um, that ends up not truly being the case because um, Dementis ends up like following them and uh, eventually catches up to them. Um, and this is where we have, to me, like one of the weirdest death scenes in the film. Um, so we see kind of like what leads up to this is we see um, uh, Furiosa, like she gets her arm mangled, right? And this is the arm that has the, the star map on it. Um, and you see a uh, jacket shot and their vehicle gets overturned. So pretty much Dementis has them captured. Um, so Dementis decides to string up Jack and he's just strung up and being pulled behind by cars for hours and hours right but we actually don't really see his death and also Furiosa never really has i think a true reaction to his death and i thought that was bizarre storytelling right because you put jack into the story you try to make him be this like you know really good guy he's someone that um Furiosa looks up to in a variety of ways but then his death scene pretty much is like, just like it happened and it's over. And I didn't get that. What did you feel about Jack's death scene or lack thereof? I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't really focused on Jack's death because Jack was such an insignificant character that it, you know, they kind of flew under my radar. What I will say is- I mean, sure, but We've spent like 40 to 50 minutes with this guy at this stage, right? So I totally agree with you. But like the story builds up on that being important, <laughs> right? But it was a bait and switch kind of thing. It's like it, it, it's like they're yeah, they're, true. They're trying, they're trying to make you say, "Oh, this guy's this guy's important. He's going to play a huge role in Furiosa's life," and then he ends up you know getting dragged around for hours and hours. What I will say, what I found really really funny was the fact that it was the fact that they're that for hours and hours, these guys are just basically going around a fucking circle in the <laughs> middle of the desert. Right. And it's like, and, and it's like, they're not having to stop to refuel. They're not having to, they don't get tired or anything. So apparently, you know, in the words of Steve Rogers, they can do this all day, mm -hmm. but, 
But what's even funnier is that when Dementis goes to check on Furiosa, he sees that she's escaped, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm I'm thinking cut off the arm, oh, right? Pretty badass. Right. Cut off the arm. Yep, 140. They're pulling 147 hours um, right there. Yes. Um, but what I find so what I find so hilarious is the fact that you got you know, you've got all these dudes on motorcycles just like going around in circles for hours and hours. You, you think one of them would have you know would have noticed you know, yeah. you know one armed lady like scurrying <laughs> off and, and 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 I don't know about you but I imagine if you had to hack off your you know one of your arms, you know you're probably not going to be moving very very fast because you'll probably be going going through a lot of um things like i don't know like being stunned being confused you know you know suffering from severe blood loss so Shock. <laughs> yeah so so you're not gonna so you're, so you're not gonna be very um you, you know coherent as you're as, as you're escaping through the desert so i'm i'm quite i'm fairly certain at least one of these guys would have noticed something but no they're just like driving away merrily as if nothing's happened and yeah. then by the time they figure out what's going on they're like oh well that sucks you know <laughs> yes and she also managed not only did she escape under like i mean literally there's like a ring around them so how the hell she did that i have no idea because literally there's just a ring of vehicles around them watching them do this but not only does she cut off her arm she manages to sabotage the mentis's um vehicle as well mm -hmm. uh, all in the same effect so uh, i guess props to her um you know uh, she clearly is capable of doing that. Um, so yeah, this kind of leads to like our last leg of the film, which to me is like the most pointless in a way, um, because Furiosa like kind of gets back to the Citadel uh, and they make a big deal about this, you know, fight between Dementis and Immortan Joe. And they, it's called the 40 Days War. And like, it's just kind of like all done as a backdrop. Like, I don't know why you make, like why create a war just like have it be like oh you know he's gonna go attack them or something like that like why make it like a big war like you're trying to add this like i don't know cool aspect of this really big thing but it's really just totally pointless to talk about that because we don't really see the war it just kind of happens in like a brief flash forward and i'm just like okay whatever fine you want to have a war um but furiosa she ends up you know, she gets a little prosthetic arm like she has in um, Fury Road. Um, she goes out there to chase after um, Dementis. You know, there's kind of this, um, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, chase sequence where um, we don't know who Dementis is. So, you know, she's having to, you know, do all this extra work. Uh, eventually, we, she finds Dementis and she um, pretty much tortures and kills him. Um, and I guess we could talk about that as the finale because it's really, I didn't understand what they were going for with this. Um, because like you have, um, you know, she captures him and you kind of have like all these, like, I guess, different versions of how he dies. One is she just flats out shoots him. One, she like drags him behind the car, similar to how Jack got killed. Um, so you kind of have that. Um, and then you have, I guess, ultimately what happened, which was she, I guess, Dementis is somehow, like, surviving as, like, food for, I guess, the peach tree that, uh, by the way, she she has this um, peach seed that her mom gave her, I guess we should bring that up, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that ends up being, um, you know, you just see this tree growing out of Dementis, and I'm like, okay, that's, one way I don't think I've seen anyone die is death by being like plant food. Um, but I, I don't know why, why did you feel like we went through this random of like how many ways this guy could have died at the end? I'm again, I'm thinking the director is like, I've got two hours and 30 minutes to <laughs> fill. I might as well just fill it with something that is going to blow people's minds away. You know, I, I guess so. It was, I think more shocking than sensible, but you know, Hey, whatever. Um, but yeah. And then that's really where the story ends. We kind of get like some post credit sequences where we see her, you know, taking the, the wives and, you know, it kind of just goes into fury road. Um, so they pretty much just replay scenes from that. 
through the end credits. Um, and yeah, that's Furiosa. And I, I guess my kind of final thoughts on this was, um, I absolutely thought that this would be... Um, I'm surprised that this tanked as bad as it did. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first one, right, Fury Road, um, it got absolutely, it got tons of acclaim, right? I, I, I think critics and audiences alike, they absolutely love the first one. Um, it's probably one of the, like, action movies. I can't think of maybe another example. I'm sure there is some, but as far as action movies go, like, I don't remember an action movie that's gotten this much praise in quite some time. Um, but it absolutely did get that at the time. So when this came up, I'm like, okay, well, this should be a slam dunk, right? Like, you know, people really like the first one. Um, you know, having another film in this universe could do great. And it totally tanked. And to tell you the truth, I don't really know why. Um, I think as far as like a sequel goes, um, you know, some of the action set pieces, um, they make it bigger and grander, which is what I would expect in a sequel. Um, so we see more of that stuff. Um, I, I do feel like it feels more fake than the first one. There's like times where it, you can just tell it looks like kind of like really bad green screen effects. Like, you know, they're trying to get them into the scenes and it just doesn't feel real. Um, I don't know if it's because, you know, you're basing this on a character, Furiosa, which I mean was a cool character, but that's all she was, right? Like you're you're trying to make more of this universe on a character that was just kind of there. Um, I, I don't know. Why do you think this movie ultimately failed, in your opinion, uh, from a box office perspective, at least? I mean, I, I, I'll tell you what I think. I think the problem was they saw they saw that Fury Road did so well, and they they decided, you know, we need to know more about Furiosa. So I. I so I think what they did was they in, instead of doing a sequel, they went with a prequel, an origin story, as it were. And origin stories, you know, it, for, for me, I, 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 they're really, really difficult to pull off, right? Because, um, because when you've uh, because when you've established a character um, and a storyline in a universe that everybody's familiar with, you know, if you go back in time and try to tinker with, you, you know. You know, with the, with the beginning of a character, it's so easy to to mess things up that you know that it can you know destroy any goodwill that people might have for um, for the previous installments. So I think I think what they were I think what they what they did with Furiosa was they were just trying to do too much, right? Yes, they they were trying to cram you know her early childhood in there as much as possible. They they had far too many villains in there, right? So, you know, so you could sort of see Dementis had a role in shaping her, but Immortan Joe was in the last installment, so let's have him in there too, because because he might have um, a hand in shaping Furiosa, which, by the way, he didn't in, in this movie, oddly enough. And, and they were just trying to do so many things in this origin story that you, you had no idea of what the hell they were doing. Because yeah. if the idea, because if the idea of the origin is to, you know, show us the events that that shaped her and turned her into who she is in, in Fury Road, they failed spectacularly. Really, they the fact that they were just trying to do too many things ended up coming back and biting them in the ass as a result. So. So I think with um, I think with Furiosa, what what they should have done right was was I think he, here's how I think they, they they should have executed it right. They should you, you know they, they should have had Furiosa live this idealized life in the oasis where she has no idea of what the outside world is like right. She gets kidnapped by the marauders and her mom you know. You know, you know, kills these guys, and there probably should be a scene where she where she kills both of these guys in cold blood, right? Even even if they're begging for mercy, yeah. Um, because then that would teach Furiosa the lesson that hey, you know, life you know, life isn't as I isn't as nice as as you think it is. Um, and then you would introduce you know Dementis in there, right? Because we know Dementis isn't going to survive you know the first movie anyway, so. You know, whatever happens to him happens to him. Um, 
you know, it, you know, if you know, it flash forward, it flash forwards to um, to the attack on the Citadel where we get an introduction to Immortan Joe. I wouldn't even have the trade, right? I would just have Furiosa living with um, Furiosa living with um, Dementis because then, you know, because because then th that kind of gives her the incentive to you know to you know to plot her revenge and 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 kind of work her way up into the inner circle of Dementis to where she can get close enough to kind of you know fulfill her um her, her plan for revenge right um so i so i so i think i i think the movie should have centered around the relationship between Dementis and Furiosa you know in in greater detail rather than what we have here where it's kind of you know all over the place right yeah. you can't you can't decide on whether you, on whether you need to, need to focus on Dementis or or more Joe, yeah. So um, so in this scenario, I would say just focus on Dementis and and Furiosa. You have the you, you have the in, incident where where they make a, a final attack on the Citadel, right? Um, you, you know, Immortan Joe is Dementis are are, are are fighting one another. Immortan Joe kills Dementis, and that. You know, and that pisses off Furiosa because she, you know, she's been wanting to kill Dementis from the very beginning, and she, and, and that moment in, in the battle would have been the perfect moment. But that kind of, you know, but that kind of, you know, robs her of of any consolation for, mm -hmm. you know, for closure. So there, you know, so there, you know, the Marauders they get they get defeated, and Furiosa, you know, gets absorbed into into the Citadel, and then she kind of works her way up, and they kind of. You know, and then that kind of takes us into Fury Road, where now she's Imperator, right? Yes. I, I, I think that's ideally that that's how I would have approached it, because at least that way it would have been more streamlined, and Immortan Joe killing Dementis at the very end would have had a far more greater impact. Not because she developed this, you know, the Stockholm Syndrome connection with Dementis, but because she had been waiting for so long, she she had to work her way up into his inner circle and gain his trust. But now that that moment's been taken away from her, now now her anger is directed towards Immortan Joe for mm. having for having you know taken that taken taken what would have been the closure for her at, at, at the very end, right? Yes. I wouldn't I, I I wouldn't have included Praetorian Jack because he, he because frankly I mean you know do we really care about a guy who drives cabbages all over Australia? I don't. I mean, I I wouldn't have bothered with with him. I wouldn't have bothered with with, with, you know, with any of the characters. I I would have kept it. I would have kept kept the the you know the protagonist down to at least you know five or six characters, right? Because at least that way it's easier to follow what they're doing. But that's that's yeah. just me. What, yeah, what, 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 do, what do you much, think? No, I, I agree with that. I, I think there was definitely I think too much when you try to split it up the way that you do because we kind of know about it, Martin Joe. So I get why you want to try to tie him into the story, but he played a much bigger role than I was expecting. Um, and then you also have Dementis on the side. That is also there, and and I will say one thing I will applaud this movie for um, Chris Hemsworth's performance. Right, so when I watched it the first time, I was like, you know, he did fine. You know, whatever. You know, it wasn't anything too crazy. On second mm -hmm. viewing, um, I definitely liked him more. So I, I will give him props for that. Um, but you're right. I, I felt like the story that you're trying to create just. Um, you just are not focusing on the things that you want to focus on. I think they tried to, you know, do like more world building in a world that if you want to do that, that's fine. But it's not like what I think the first one did the best with. Right. It was really just about kind of this long action set piece that you have. So there's a little bit of world building sprinkled in, but not a lot. So I feel like you try to expand on that, but then you, you start to put too much focus on it and the cracks start to fall in when you just don't have it set up in a way that makes a whole lot of sense or at least from my perspective so um so yeah i think that they could have done a lot i think they should have done some things differently i think you know we spend way too much time as little furiosa and not enough time as anya taylor joy furiosa um because to me that's what people are going to be more engaged with and i just think that some of the actions of the characters were just too dumb for me to just ignore it um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I mean, I think the film is fine for what it does, um, but I don't think it really lives up to what the first one did. Uh, and I think a lot of it just goes to the fact that you're just doing too much with this universe when it really should be a, a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. 
So I guess for myself, my, you know, kind of final verdict on this was I, I would probably give this a, which I don't even know what to give it. Um, the two point, the, the, let's just do a 2.5 out of five. Like it's a, it's, well, let's give it a three. I'll give it a three. I'll give it a three out of five, right? I know I just totally went, but I think the action set pieces are fun, even though I don't think they're as good as the first one is. I think there's some good, you know, sequences. I Like I said, I, I did really like Dementis. Um, but yeah, there's just things that just didn't really jive with me. Um, I guess, oh, and I guess, once again, the humor was really off-putting at times. I don't know why I was introduced. Um, I think Morton Joe, like, one of them's like sounds like scrotus and the other one's like rectus erectus i'm like what what is happening here like is it you what is this a comedy skit what's going on and it just i don't know there's just things in there that i didn't really enjoy that took me out of it that i felt like didn't even happen so i, I don't know it's somewhere between a 2.5 and 3 i couldn't even tell you after watching it what i feel about it well i'll put you down for a three just for um just for editing uh, purposes fine. um fine. I, I see your 2.5. I'm going to steal it um, just because. <laughs> hey, you, I mean, you should have stuck with it, man. You, you uh, damn it. Around. You're right. Fine. I, I, fine. Yes. Go ahead. No, no backseas, Lee. No backseas. Yeah, fine. But, uh, <laughs> Let's about 2.5. But um, I, I, mean, I, I will say this. I mean, it, it's, it's one of those movies where if you just want to turn your brain off for two hours and not think about it, it's fine. And 20 minutes, two hours and 20 minutes. I mean, it, it's 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 one of the, it's one of those movies where, I mean, w well, any Mad Max movie you're gonna watch, it's not a thinker, right? It's not, it's not one of those movies you're gonna you're, you're gonna get on on the computer afterwards and write to the Academy and say, for the love of God, please give them, <laughs> please give them an award for for this year they, because they That's blew my fucking mind. Mm -hmm. But um, but I mean, but I mean, like it's 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 bloated. There's nothing. Yes, there's nothing about it that that's cohesive, and there's nothing about it that that makes any sense. Like if you, it, it's one of the it, it's one of those things where you kind of have to look at it, you know, the big picture. Because if you if you if, if you try to figure out like what's going on in this particular scene or in this particular chapter, it makes no sense, right? It's it, it it's like it's one of it's like one of those things where it's like one of those things where you know if, if you look at the individual scenes it's complete nonsense it makes absolutely no sense it's a non sequitur but when you oddly enough but when you put them all together you you can sort of understand where it's going but not really i mean i mean obviously it's not going to get any props for sto you know for storytelling but i will i i i will say that anya taylor joy did a phenomenal job given yeah. Yes. given what she had to had to deal with i will I mean, say this though um and i didn't I, I don't know if you noticed this everybody in the movie spoke with an aussie accent the guy who plays praetorian jack he he's an english actor right but he makes a concerted effort he does his part and does the aussie accent Honey taylor joy is the only person who can't be bothered to do an aussie accent and that's what i thought was so weird is because you, you know, because uh, as a kid, they make it very clear that that she was born and raised in post-apocalypse Australia, right? So presumably everybody around her is going to be speaking in, in that accent. But the entire time, she's just speaking in a regular American accent. And for the life of me, I'm just I'm just sitting there like wondering, like, did, did you did you try to make an effort to speak in an Aussie accent? And I I can only think I can only think that. Anya Taylor Joy is one of those actors who's just so good that she doesn't need to put on an accent. She's like Sean Connery, really. <laughs> it's like Sean Connery in The Untouchables. Like, like, yeah, he's playing a cop in 1920s America, but he still has that Scottish accent. I mean, Anya Taylor Joy is living in post-apocalyptic Australia, where she was, you know, born and raised, and yet she's speaking in an American accent. Um, or Sean Connery. I'm in Highlander. That's a Spanish person with a Scottish accent. So. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I will say I I do really like Anya Taylor Joy. Um, I don't think she has the physicality that Charlie Theron had. Um, I will just say that as final note, not to you know drag this out any longer. But that that um, was a surprise casting. I'll I'll be honest yes. with you because I, yes. I, I, because because and. 
this is just going to speculation. I would have thought they could have gotten like someone more robust or at least someone more experienced in, in these action films. Like, um, do you remember that? Um, do you remember the, um, that the latest installment of tomb Raider, um, uh, that yes. they had, the, the, I, I felt like she would have been a perfect fit for Furiosa. Um, personally, personally speaking, like they could have gotten her or they could have gotten, um, not Ronda Rousey, but uh, who else? Because um, you remember he, 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 who's the name of that chick um, who was in who was in Hobbs and Shaw? Who, she was the um, not Vanessa Kirby, but that Spanish lady. Um, oh, I I know you're talking. About. I I don't remember the name because yeah, the one you're talking about from um, um, from um, the 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 the, 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 the whatever you just meet- talked. Oh. They, 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 they they meet up at that Russian at that Russian. Yeah, I know. Thing. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I don't. I remember thought I, I, I thought she I thought she would have been good, in, you know, in, in the lead role as well. Um, but I, I mean, but you know, but for for what it is, I think I think Anya Taylor Joy knocked it out of the park. Um, on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that is going to do it for our review of Furio. So let us know down in the comments below if you agree with us or if you'd like to point out the fact that the movie Pope was wrong the first time and he's wrong about this again. You won't hurt our feelings. Well, I'll won't hurt my feelings anyway. Um, but, <laughs> but other than that, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this episode, and we'll catch you in the next one. Bye.